Thanks to Roger and Stan for the invitation to spend a few uh, minutes with you all tonight and to um, just share a little bit about my experience uh, getting involved with global ophthalmology kind of early on in my career and uh, just to share a few uh, experiences from the Global Ophthalmology Fellowship this year which has just been a truly phenomenal experience and, and um, you know really a uh, dream come true for me and my family and so yeah, I'm really, really happy to be here with you all tonight. Um, first, I want to thank a couple of my mentors, Dr. Jeff Tabin, who has been a longtime uh, inspiration and, and mentor and someone who initially sparked my interest in uh, getting involved in ophthalmology in the first place and certainly in global ophthalmology and um, really for the last 10 years has been a phenomenal mentor and then this past year has been um, a just fantastic fellowship director. And also Matt Oliva, who also has been a long time uh, role model for me and who I've worked extensively with this uh, past year um, is the HCP fellow and who I'm really uh, pleased to be joining in practice next year in, in Medford, Oregon. I also want to thank my family. Um, as, as Roger mentioned, they've kind of traveled to the ends of the earth with me this past year and it's been quite an adventure with uh, our two kids and all the, all the changes in um, sights and sounds and scenery and culture and food and uh, all the organization and effort that goes into making that happen and my my wife Cosette was definitely the the MVP in, in making all of that go smoothly this year and so I want to want to thank them so um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about how I got um, interested in the first place basically I um, saw a video um, from National Geographic showing Dr. Jeff Tabin and Dr. Sandek Ruit uh, going into the remote villages of Nepal where Dr. Ruit is from um, and basically trekking with gear on their backs and on animals to go set up these mobile eye camps back in the early days of the Himalayan Cataract Project and it showed the same thing. It showed the overnight transformation of somebody being completely blind and then overnight having their sight and really their life restored. And I was a first year medical student in 2005 when I saw this video and was just totally stunned by um, that transformation and um, immediately you know, started uh, trying to find anything that I could on Dr. Ruit and Dr. Tabin and their work, started reading, started watching videos. And even at that very early stage of my training, just realized that, that there's nothing more exciting in, in medicine than giving someone their sight back overnight, and I, I really wanted to do it. Um, so I reached out to Dr. Tabin not really knowing what to expect. Uh, I was just a first year medical student on the other side of the country and there's really no reason for him to respond to my email but I shot him an email and just let him know that I was you know, really interested in, in what he was doing and um, that I would love to come you know, work with him, do research with him, help him really in any way that I could as, as, a, as a first year medical student. And uh, to my amazement within a day or so he, he actually responded and and although he had um, unfortunately already had a student scheduled for that summer he invited me to come out to the Moran Eye Center in Salt Lake City and work with one of his partners doing some ophthalmology research um, so I really appreciated that he could have just said no I you know I've got somebody but he you know he created an opportunity for me to come out there and at least to do some sort of research so at the end of my first year I made the you know, 27 hour trek in my car out to Salt Lake City from Ohio and started working with one of his partners there, Dr. Majid Moshefar, who was also a fabulous mentor and teacher. Um, the, the subject of the research we worked on was um, related to LASIK surgery and for those of you who aren't um, maybe in ophthalmology, um, everybody's heard of LASIK, but it's, it's laser vision correction. It's an elective procedure generally associated with the more well-off uh, people in developed countries and so kind of a far cry from global ophthalmology and restoring sight to the blind but at least it was it was something and um, so I, I tried to work hard that summer and I worked with Dr. Moshefar and his fellow Huck Holtz um, on this paper that I did eventually end up getting published and um, that summer although it was much different from what I had, had anticipated in terms of um, 
you know, the subject matter turned out to be a, a great benefit to me in multiple ways down the road. So at the end of that year, I, or at the end of that summer, I went back to my second year of medical school at Ohio State and wanted to do something that was a little more closely tied to uh, eye care in Africa or eye care in the developing world. And so I uh, came across this organization, Unite for Sight, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And um, they have chapters. It's a, it's a student-run organization um, devoted to uh, uh, raising awareness of blindness in the developing world and then also raising money for sight restoring cataract surgeries. Um, in underdeveloped places, and um, they have chapters at various universities, and so along with some like-minded friends at Ohio State, we started a chapter, and I also went back to my undergrad alma mater, BYU, and started a chapter there, and um, had had a, a good time, um, you know, working with them and, and working with uh, these classmates of mine. At the end of my second year, there was a, a student government fundraiser where they were going to put on um, a fundraiser for some charitable organization and you could make a pitch to have, that, have it support your organization. So we pitched Unite for Sight and we're fortunate to, um, to be chosen to be the beneficiary of this, uh, um, this fundraiser. And so once that happened, I went to the uh, Department of Ophthalmology and asked them if I could just make a brief um, you know, announcement about this before grand rounds. And so I, I went to the early morning grand rounds as a, I guess, a second year medical student and obviously slightly intimidated. You know, this was the crowd that I hoped to join in a few years as a resident and didn't really know too many people there and got up and started talking about how excited we were that, you know, we were going to raise money for sight restoring cataract surgery and wanted to invite anybody to be involved. But then when I told them what the fundraiser was, it was a paintballing event, um, you know, out some country paintballing farm, um, the, the residency program director raised his hand and said, um, you do realize that paintball injuries are uh, the source of some of the most severe eye injuries out there. And so, I, you know, I, for whatever reason, I hadn't really put the two, to, two and two together, but of course, you know, paintballing is, is dangerous in terms of um, eye safety. And so it was just kind of a funny, funny incident, but they did go on to support us uh, after everybody, you know, swore uh, <laughs> to, wear, to wear their safety goggles. And we were able to raise money for about uh, 40 uh, sight restoring cataract surgeries in the developing world through that, through that event. Um, so then uh, as I went through my second year, towards the end of that second year, I had the chance to join a Unite for Sight conference um, in, at, in Palo Alto at Stanford University where I again crossed paths with Dr. Tabin and he was speaking about um, a new development in the Himalayan Cataract Projects initiatives where they're working with United Nations Millennium Villages Project in 12 different countries throughout Africa. Um, I had served, uh, when I was a, after my freshman year at BYU, I had served a two-year mission for our church in Southern Africa and had always hoped to do something in medicine that would allow me to, to go back there. And so this kind of uh, melding of global eye care, sight restoring cataract surgery, and now this news that they were working in Africa. I was extremely excited, and I went up to Dr. Tabin after the presentation, just said, hey, you know, I really do want to get involved with this, and he said, yeah, 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 you know, we'll, we'll work something out, just keep me posted on your plans and stuff, but, um, you know, I, I knew that if I was going to start third year of medical school in just a few months, that I really wouldn't be able to work on it. I wouldn't really have time. Um, and so I had this kind of crazy impression, crazy thought that maybe I should actually take a year off between my second and third year if I was really serious about working on this project with him. And the deadline for doing that for people who wanted to take a year off to do, you know, an MPH or to go to the NIH and do research or something like that was approaching within a week or so. And so I really had to make the decision quickly. And in the end, I, I decided that it was really worth it to me. This is what I wanted to do long term. And so I actually took a year off of medical school kind of on a few days notice. And when I went to the, um, when I went to the, the dean's office, you know, they kind of expect you to explain what you're going to do, what your plan is. I didn't really have a great plan. I had applied to the National Eye Institute in Washington, D.C. and a couple other things. I hadn't heard back, and Dr. Tabin hadn't really been able to give me any concrete 
um, plan. And so I just told him, well, I'm going to go to Washington, D.C. And, and do research. I've applied to the National Eye Institute. Um, shortly, so, you know, they said, okay, you know, whatever, suit yourself. And um, I went off to Washington, D.C. Well, so what happened was I, I, my application at the NIH was uh, rejected. They didn't have any spots. I'd applied really late. And so I was kind of scrambling for something to do. And I reached, reached out to one of the co-authors on that uh, LASIK paper that I had written with Dr. Moshe Farr, who was in Washington, D.C., and um, his practice there. And he said, yeah, sure, you can come out and do research with us. So I went to Washington, D.C., and again, the, the subject matter of my research was premium intraocular lenses. We were studying contrast sensitivity with restore lenses, which for those of you who aren't in ophthalmology, it's kind of this, um, you know, again, uh, an elective sort of premium intraocular lens you can, you can have put in, but again, kind of a far cry from restoring sight to the blind. And so my plan was to work in, in D.C. until I could set something up with Dr. Tabin and, um, and then hopefully go spend part of the year out at the Moran or, or working internationally with him. So over a course of about six months as I was doing this research, I tried to get in touch with Dr. Tabin, um, but he travels so much and he's just, he gets so many emails. It, it proved more difficult than I thought. And, um, you know, six months had passed and I hadn't been able to set anything up here. I'd taken this year off of medical school without much to show for it in terms of, you know, the real reason why I wanted to do that. Um, and then one day I was looking on the Himalayan Cataract Project website and I saw a picture of uh, Jeff working with uh, Huck Holtz in Ghana. And Huck was one, the one that I, the fellow that I had worked on that paper with that first summer. And so I, I reached out to Huck and I said, hey, Huck, you know, if you happen to see or talk to Dr. Tame, would you mind just reminding him of my interest? And Huck was nice enough to do that for me. And within a week or so, I got an email from Dr. Tabin saying, hey, we've got this great project for you in Ethiopia. Um, would you like to come, come with us? And I was obviously, you know, through the roof with excitement. And there was, he mentioned in his email, hey, there's a small chance that there might be this Ethiopian medical student from the United States who might be available. And since he speaks the language, he might be able to come. But um, as of now, you know, you know we want you to come. So I finished up my research in Washington, D.C., packed up the car, made the 35-hour drive out to Salt Lake City, and then shortly after arriving there, I got another email from Dr. Tabin that, unfortunately, um, you know, this, this Ethiopian medical student who speaks Amharic was going to be able to go, and so they actually weren't able to take a second medical student. So I was kind of bummed. I was already there, and I was ready to, ready to roll. But he did say, you know, if you want to stay out here and, and do research uh, for the next few months uh, until you go back to medical school, you're more than welcome to. And so I did that. And for the next three months, I worked on um, a project which was exactly what I hoped to work on. It was on the economic impact of site restoring cataract surgery in sub-Saharan Africa. And as a basis for that, um, I got to do a comprehensive review of um, the causes and magnitude of blindness for all 47 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and also research about the economic impact of, of site restoration. Well, long story short, actually, it's been a pretty long story, but um, when I was a fourth-year medical student, um, my wife and I had the chance to follow up on that study that I did with Jeff and actually go to Ghana, where he and Huck and some others had done a, a big cataract outreach for several hundred patients three years before. And so we got to interview these uh, patients three years after cataract surgery and find out how um, sight restoration had impacted their life from an economic standpoint, from a social standpoint, from a family standpoint. And um, it's just a truly incredible opportunity for us and um, sort of the start of um, really some exciting things. This is um, a photo from my wife and I out doing interviews um, in one of these remote villages um, through the Millennium Villages Project and Himalayan Cataract Project Partnership. So just a few lessons that I've, that I've learned kind of along the way. Um, first of all, you know, find something that truly excites you. I assume if you're watching this webinar, then, then global ophthalmology probably um, excites you. But whatever it is, you know, find, find that aspect of global ophthalmology or, or find whatever it is that you know, doesn't really feel like work because you enjoy it so much. And that's, that's kind of how, how I felt about, um, about this. And 
then you know pursue it persistently. Um, as you know, like with anything, anything worth working for, anything that's that's really worthwhile, you'll run into roadblocks and setbacks. Um, so you know, don't be annoying, uh, but be persistent in in going after um, what you want to do. And then when those delays and setbacks or disappointments come along, try try the best you can to turn those into opportunities, um, because usually there's um, there is opportunity behind all of those things, and you know be willing to take some risks or do unconventional things if you feel like it's going to lead you to to where you want to go. The second thing is find a mentor. Um, I feel really fortunate to have had a number of great mentors, and I, I feel like um, you know the best thing to do is to find a way to help them, find out what they're working on, and ask yourself, you know, what could I really do that would be helpful to them. Um, so often people will ask, hey, can I come to Africa with you? Or, hey, can I, you know, come on an outreach with you? Um, and of course, like, you know, people are, are willing to facilitate that and want to give people that experience and teach. But um, if you say, hey, I understand that you guys are raising money for an outreach. Can I help fundraise for you? Um, this is a project, this is an idea that I have, you know, would this work? Or, um, hey, I understand that you're writing a research paper on this. I would love to do the literature review for you or whatever, you know, but find a way to truly help your mentor and then um, just be as low maintenance as possible. Just work, work, work and just exceed their expectations. And in my, in my experience, that will really open a lot of doors and, um, and opportunities will come along if you do that. This is just a quote that I, I like. It's actually from a, a bluegrass band, and I don't listen to bluegrass all the time, but when I do, I listen to the hot buttered rum. Um, this is a song called Firefly, but wade into the streams that lead you to your dreams. And, um, you know, that's true. Just, um, you know, find mentors who do what you want to do and kind of follow in their footsteps and, and try to be helpful and, and go out there and, and take some risks. So a few of the facts about global blindness that I think have been influential for me and that I think are extremely motivating um, in terms of you know, getting involved in this work. First of all, people always think, oh, well, blindness is so far down the priority list. There's HIV AIDS, there's TB, there's malaria. There's all of these other really pressing global health challenges, and that's true. Um, but the global burden of disease um, you know, relatively speaking, eye conditions um, are the sixth highest burden right behind HIV AIDS. And so really the global impact is, is huge. It doesn't only affect that person, of course it affects the family members, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the total cost of global blindness at $4.3 trillion is pretty staggering. That includes not only the direct costs, but also what we call dead weight losses, productivity losses, informal costs. Um, inability to perform activities of daily living, relying on a family member. Um, more often than not, um, that family member that has to stay behind and take care of a blind, um, uh, a blind, you know, father or mother or uncle or grandmother, grandfather, is a child, and and it's usually um, a female child, and it usually means lost opportunities for education and lost opportunities for you know, the social interaction, the growth they should be having at that time in their life. And, you know, so it, it truly is um, a ripple effect on families, on communities, and, um, and on countries. And so, you know, worldwide there's 45 million blind. 90% uh, of these live in the developing world, which tells us right away this is not just a medical problem, but this is an economic problem, it's a poverty-related problem. Um, is an access to care problem. And the most astonishing fact to me is that 80% of blindness is completely avoidable. That means it's either preventable or it's treatable. And um, you can't say that about very many diseases in the world, especially um, on that list of, of those that are creating the highest bird worldwide, 80% being avoidable. Another truly astonishing fact is that life expectancy for the blind in the developing world is one-third that for their age-matched peers. Uh, for adults, it usually means less than 10 years, and blind ch children fare even worse than that. 
So greater than 50% of global blindness is due to cataract, a completely treatable condition. For those of you that may not be ophthalmologists, um, you know, cataract is where a clear lens over time becomes cloudy. In the United States, we tend to take care of this really quickly. As soon as you have trouble, you know, seeing your golf ball on the fairway, you get cataract surgery. But in the, de in the developing world, um, this, uh, these cataracts can progress until total blindness and can be completely debilitating. This is just uh, showing how a lens and or how light enters the eye um, in a normal eye and is focused by the lens on the retina, but in a cataractous eye, light comes in and is totally scattered by the lens and eventually completely blocked by the lens as the cataract progresses. This is an example of a white mature cataract in a patient in Ghana. This is another patient that we operated on in Ghana who was young, he was in his 20s, but had bilateral um, mature cataracts. These are four cataracts that I pulled out just in an afternoon in Ethiopia. I pulled out this, this first one, which won the trophy for the, the biggest and blackest of the entire uh, year, actually. <laughs> and then after I pulled that one out, I thought, oh, I'm just going to save the rest of them and kind of show the spectrum. But this cataract is a you know pretty mild, moderate cataract, maybe something like you might have in the United States when it, when it gets taken out. And then this would be considered a dense cataract in the United States. This would be considered an extremely dense cataract. And this is just never even seen in the United States. Completely black cataract, hard as a pebble. But these are you know, fairly routine in places like Ethiopia. And this person would have been blind probably for a decade. So you know, again, this is a condition which is completely curable. And not only is it curable, but it's curable with a 10-minute surgery and about $25 per eye, literally curable overnight. The World Bank, for this reason, has called cataract surgery one of the most highly cost-effective uh, public health interventions available. And so what are global needs? What's a way for us to, to get involved? One of the great needs worldwide is infrastructure. Uh, facilities, equipment, instruments, I'm including equipment and instruments in there. Um, what are ways that we can get involved? As we go through and talk about a few different ways to get involved, I'm just going to give you some profiles of volunteers who have worked with the Himalayan Cataract Project just in this past year um, to help address some of these issues. So this is Tom Lepfer, he's president of Clarity Designs in San Diego, California. He um, he was inspired by the book Second Sons, which is a, a book about Jeff Tabin and Sondek Ruit founding the Himalayan Cataract Project. And um, he actually, Tom had actually long ago been a classmate of Jeff's at Oxford when they were both Marshall Scholars. But he read this book and was just, you know, amazed by what Jeff had been doing. And so he actually hired a young engineer from UC San Diego and put him at HCP's disposal basically to help develop new technology, to help work out maintenance and repair issues for um, their equipment around the world. And he also sponsored an uh, innovation competition in San Diego um, with engineering students to help develop more low cost and, and portable uh, devices for the developing world, things like non-contact tenometers and things like that. And it's really just been a great um, friend and support to the Himalayan Cataract Project. This is Orlando, the engineer that he hired. Orlando came out with me to Nepal for a month and spent time with uh, the engineering team at Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology there and has continued to do some great work for us. Um, the second thing is training. Of course, worldwide, we need more training of ophthalmologists. We need more optometrists, more ophthalmic nurses, more community eye health workers. Um, in, in the ophthalmology world, what can we do about that? We can try to find ways to help improve formal training programs abroad, so um, residency programs and where appropriate fellowship training programs. Um, even after training, there's always a need for continued in-practice training, um, improvement in cataract surgery skills. So there are some places, lots of places in the world, where uh, surgeons are not yet using SICS. And I won't get into too much detail. That's sort of a lecture all on its own. But SICS is really the state of the art for cataract surgery in, in low income settings and has been shown to be equivalent to phacal emulsification, which is what we do in the United States in a head-to-head -head trial between Sandak Ruit and David Chang um, 
in a SICS versus FACO study, which was done in Nepal in 2007. But anyhow, um, surgeons worldwide in underdeveloped settings really need to learn how to do high quality SICS. Um, and then FACO emulsification, I add that here. Some people might think, well, why are you teaching FACO in the developing world? But we actually teach it at all of our Himalayan cataract project centers because in most of these places, there are people who can afford to pay for FACO, and it does help to subsidize and support um, patients who can't pay for surgery, who just can't afford it. And so it does help subsidize the SICS programs and enable more people to have site restoring surgery. And then, of course, subspecialty training. Most places in the developing world are not getting subspecialty training, and so that's an ongoing need. So, you know, what can you do in that regard? Well, for um, you know, ophthalmologists in practice, you have the opportunity to be a mentor, and the opportunities really are limitless. Whatever your specialty, whatever your background, there are opportunities to become a mentor. And what we encourage is starting a long-term relationship with somebody, somebody that you're going to continue to work with over time, rather than just going to one place one year and another place another year. Um, of course, when you go on site to visit lectures, hands-on training, um, bilateral exchange of skills are all really important. Um, we also feel like in, in terms of bilateral exchange that having the, uh, the person that you're mentoring come and spend time with you in the United States, um, getting hands-on training with some of the state-of-the-art uh, equipment and so forth and seeing how you practice or, um, you know, some sort of a, a rotational program with spending time with you and maybe some of your colleagues other places and then going back home um, is really beneficial and it's especially beneficial if you can then go back with them to their own country sort of a, fan, a sandwich fellowship type of arrangement um, where you know they come to the United States and you go back with them and make sure that they can implement what they've learned what they've been taught and to be honest every place you go you're going to learn so much from anybody that you're trying to mentor or train. They, um, you know, in Nepal, in Ethiopia, and gone everywhere I went, I learned a great deal. And, you know, I went to Nepal for SICS training. They practice the state of the art in Nepal and in India. And um, it's a, a truly different surgery from FACO. And no matter how many FACOs you've done, you'll, you'll feel like a resident again when you're learning SICS. And so it truly is a bilateral exchange. You learn a great deal. Uh, from those that you, you know, are mentoring, and they're, they're also mentoring you, and that's why we say bilateral exchange. Um, and then, you know, another thing you can do if, if you're not, um, you know, able to go and travel abroad, you can just sponsor somebody uh, to come and to attend the academy meetings or come and attend ASCRS or whatever meeting is most appropriate for them based on their interests. But there are certainly opportunities to do that, and there are certainly people who don't work abroad, but they sponsor people to come over here for sandwich fellowships or to come over for meetings, and that's a phenomenal way to go. So I wanted to, to profile Dr. John Pica from Pica Eye Center in Lima, Ohio. And Dr. Pica is a longtime global volunteer himself. He's done um, international outreach for the last 30 years in um, Central and South America, and he... Um, has been a big fan of the Himalayan Cataract Project and Dr. Tabin, and uh, recently um, made a, a generous donation to HCP's work. And he also came and joined us on a outreach in Aksum, Ethiopia, and came and and, and operated with us. And um, you know, he he wanted to gain more experience with SICS. When he does his outreach, he takes a portable FACO machine, but he really wanted to learn SICS because it's so cost efficient and time efficient. The results are so good. And so after coming to Ethiopia with us, he said, gosh, you know, I really want to, to do more SICS. And so HCP has arranged for him to travel to Kenya and work with one of our partner ophthalmologists there who really wants to learn FACO. So Dr. Pike is going to teach FACO, and he's going to learn SICS from this Kenyan doctor who does really, really great SICS. And so just an example of uh, kind of bilateral exchange and, and training opportunities that are out there. And then in turn, Dr. Pike will pass on those SICS skills to the residents that he works with when he goes abroad. And so other ways to get involved, just raising awareness and funding. Of course, it all starts with funding. Everything that we do abroad is um, expensive. You know, it's expensive to plan trips, it's expensive to do the surgeries, to get the supplies, to transport the patients, to pay the staff. 
it all takes money. And so the great thing about raising awareness and fundraising is that really anybody can do it. You don't have to travel, and the returns are huge. You know, when you remember that $25 or store site to one person and, and $2,500 to 100 people, you know, those are, those are attainable numbers, and you can really make a huge impact. Um, so, you know, ideas, organize a 5K, you could run a marathon and get sponsors, you could send your kids out to the sidewalk with lemonade and, and probably come back with, with $25 after a day or two and, and, and help your kids have the opportunity to do something really significant, restore sight to somebody. You could start an online campaign, get corporate partnerships. You know, there's a, a million things you could do, and, and you probably have a lot better ideas than I do about this. But you know, we encourage people to think outside the box, um, and, and there really are great opportunities. One student who has really uh, epitomized thinking outside the box is Esteban Peralta. I'm sorry, I put MD on it. He's not. He's not actually an MD yet. He's a pre-med. <laughs> um, he's an under. He just finished his undergrad at Duke University, and he was inspired by a talk that was given by HCP uh, board member Dr. Matt Oliva at Duke a few years ago. And um, he was so interested in this, you know, restoration of sight through cataract surgery that he started an organization called Duke Lens, which is a nonprofit um, photography service. Um, on campus, and they raise awareness about global cataract blindness, and they provide photography services to different events, graduation, club meetings, um, you know, department events, and the proceeds go to um, raising funds for sight restoring cataract surgery. So he and his fellow Duke students have raised quite a bit of money for sight restoring surgeries, and then. Esteban just this past spring was able to come with us to Harare, Ethiopia. He was there at the outreach um, that you saw in that video earlier, and he also recently joined me for a trip to Nepal and helped me set up a telemedicine study in Nepal um, with this iPhone um, uh, camera attachment that we're using to do teleophthalmology for eye care there. And so he. Um, has really, you know, started from the, the ground up and has been able to have some great opportunities just based off of him taking initiative and, and doing something to, to try to be helpful. So, you know, another um, inspiring quote I think we've, we've all heard before, and I don't know that it's really attributed to anybody, but who if not me and, and when if not now. Um, you know, I, I really believe that... Uh, you know, no matter how you choose to get involved in global ophthalmology, there really isn't a better time than now. You don't, if you're not prepared at this time to travel abroad, you know, you don't have to. There's so many other ways to get involved, but just getting involved sooner rather than later um, enables you to be of more help down the road, and also, um, you know, it's just so rewarding and so much fun to to be a part of it. And I think it just en enriches your life no matter what stage you're at. Um, and no matter what you're doing in your life. And so just in, in, uh, as we wrap up a little bit here, um, a few ideas for, for undergrads. You know, we talked about the um, possibility of doing some fundraising or something like that. But also, you know, it's so common nowadays to have study abroad opportunities. And you certainly could pair a study abroad um, you know, offering with trying to meet up with either an international outreach team or just go work with some local doctors and local ophthalmologists and spend time with them and try to find some way to help them bring equipment that they need, get donations um, of needed supplies. Um, and it also as an undergrad, it's not too early to find a mentor. Again, Esteban was an undergrad when he um, sort of linked up with Dr. Oliva. And so you know, if you're interested and, and you're not quite into your medical training, don't don't be deterred by that. And getting involved can only help you as you apply to medical school and things like that. Um, med students also, you know, more and more and more global elective opportunities are becoming more widely available at medical schools. And I would wholeheartedly encourage you to take care, take advantage of those. Usually there's some funding involved. I promise you it might be the last time in your life that people are throwing money at you to, to travel internationally and to um, giving you the time off to do it. So really take advantage of those opportunities if they're available at your school. And if they're not available, maybe um, you know petition for it and try to make it happen. Um, it certainly is a mainstream thing and you could certainly make a case for why it's important. Um, 
you know, other thing, as a med student, I would really, um, you know, looking forward to ophthalmology training, I would try to make yourself aware of those programs that have great international offerings. And I'm going to show you the results of a study that we did um, just in the last couple years. Actually, when I was a resident at Ohio State, we gathered the data um, and have just been in the process of getting it published. But um, this is a just sort of the top 14 uh, programs. We surveyed all 115 programs in the United States, residency training programs in ophthalmology, and surveyed these residency program directors to find out what types of offerings they had at their, uh, in their program. And we asked them how many residents per year were able to go abroad. We asked them in the last five years how many countries have residents from your program visited. We asked, you know, um, if they allow academic time for going abroad versus if they require to use your vacation time, which is a huge deal because you get so little vacation. Um, we asked if it was funded by the department, if residents are allowed to operate, and so forth. And so then we took these results and we ranked all of the programs as having um, the highest index of global involvement to, to lowest. And um, these were the top 14 programs have to brag a little bit on University of Utah who got the high score of, of 17 and, and really has an incredible program. And the reason they have such an incredible program is because Dr. Randy Olson and his team there have invested so heavily. They spend about $4.5 million per year on international programming. And he recruited Dr. Jeff Tabin back in the mid-2000s, and um, Dr. Alan Crandall, and Greg Chaya, Jeff Petty, many others who are very actively involved um, in global ophthalmology there, and, and they really do a fantastic job, and they really prioritize it. So just be aware, and if anybody wants, I mean, this will all be posted online, but, um, and by the way, this is pre-publication, so just, you know, use it for your own, your own purposes. So, um, you know, as, as residents and fellows, again, you know, if your residency program does not offer a global um, elective, you know, and you want uh, a little bit of uh, support, a little bit of, um, you know, assistance and, and maybe trying to lobby for that, shoot me an email and I can send you all of this data of all the programs that do offer it and kind of how they go about doing it. But it's a really attractive thing to people who are applying as medical students, and I think most programs are starting to recognize that. And um, our study showed a huge increase in the number of programs offering global uh, global um, training opportunities. And then, you know, be aware that there are some global fellowships like mine. The Moran um, Eye Center is uh, the longest-standing. Um, international fellowship. The first fellow to work with Dr. Tabin as his fellow, Dr. Michael Fielmeyer, has now started a, a fellowship training, pro, an international fellowship at the University of Nebraska. There was a fellowship at Oklahoma, I'm not sure if it's still active, and then there's others that are being developed around the country. Emory is developing one, which I believe starts next year, and so just, you know, keep your ears open, but there are opportunities if you um, you know, really want to dedicate a year or even two years. Sometimes these are coupled with masters in public health, um, and so it's a two-year program. Uh, if you are willing to dedicate a year or two, there are just truly incredible opportunities. And I, I you know, you're going to have the rest of your life to practice. You're going to have the rest of your life to to make an attending salary. I wouldn't sweat the money at all. I would, you know, if you want or if you're interested and willing to do this, I would totally go for it. It's been really the best year, hands down, of my my medical training, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And that was even traveling with a wife and two kids. We we made it work, and I should mention the reason we were able to make that work is that the practice that I signed with in Oregon, we signed a year early, and they were kind enough to help support us with a little bit of a stipend, um, but it, it was expensive for me to fly my family around. And then lastly, for young ophthalmologists, um, you know, we talked about opportunities to mentor. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, try to prepare yourself before you ever go abroad. Try to prepare yourself to be as useful and productive as possible. And so especially in regards to doing cataract surgery, I mentioned Dr. Pika, who is one of the busiest and one of the best FACO surgeons in, in Ohio. 
what he told me when he was, you know, doing SICS in Ethiopia that he felt like, you know, resin again. It really is a totally different procedure, and um, it's it's a different skill set. No matter what your subspecialty is, no matter how experienced you are, SICS is just so different, and you will not be comfortable um, just sitting down and doing them um, without having practiced and really done some. Uh, dedicated training and so the training opportunities that exist every um, AAO meeting and every ASCRS meeting we have a wet lab and a lecture um, for SICS and you can come in and some of the best SICS surgeons in the world from India from Nepal from the United States from various places around the world will be there teaching hands-on and you can sit there for you know an hour and a half two hours and and have them walk you through the steps and then nothing really replaces going and having kind of an immersive training experience um, at a place like Tilganga or Aravind or some other place in the developing world where they do SICS regularly. So at the beginning of my fellowship, I had the chance to go to uh, Geta Eye Hospital in western Nepal where their volume is just mind-blowing. On their busy days, they do between four to 500 cataract surgeries per day, and that's with eight to 10 surgeons. And so, you know, uh, on certain days, certain surgeons are doing 80 plus surgeries in a day. And they don't rush, they don't hurry, they're just, ex their system is extremely efficient, and they're extremely efficient surgeons. And I, it was just mind-blowing to me to go and to watch them, and they would routinely be doing four, five, six, minute cases um, just you know beautifully and perfectly and they just do so so many that um, there's just nothing that they haven't seen before and they they handle everything so smoothly and um, so to go to a place like that and have an immersive training experience before you go out and are actually doing surgeries on your own I think is really important and so you know, seek out those opportunities, be willing to dedicate a little bit of your vacation time, a little bit of your own funds to go and to seek out these types of training opportunities so that you're really well prepared to to go out um, and, and work with a local doctor. And I, I would always say you always want to work with a local doctor. You don't want to go out and do surgery on your own. Um, you know, you un doing that, you undermine the local doctors. You um, you know, you're not helping really um, They, it, if you have complications and, you know, everybody's going to have some. These are different cataracts. They're really difficult cataracts. Um, then they're, they're taking care of those when you leave. So really, you know, partner with a local physician. Come on their invitation. Um, try to bring something that's really helpful to them. Teach them FACO or teach them something that they really want to learn. And then you likewise can, can learn from them and work with them. Um, to build up your skills so that you are, are truly helpful there. So anyway, just in, in conclusion, um, yeah, I just want to, you know, encourage you that no matter where you are in your training or no matter what you're, you're doing in life, there are definitely opportunities to get involved. And, and like I said earlier, the, the payback is huge and the return on investment is, is unlike really anything else in, in medicine and the ability to, to change somebody's life with, with so little um, financial investment. And just want to encourage you that um, if there's, you know, if you have, if you have an interest in uh, global ophthalmology that really the sooner you get involved, the, the better life gets busy and, and things get crazy and um, it's good to be able to uh, work these things into your negotiations and contracts. If you're a resident, you're looking for your job, you want to look for like-minded partners. If you're um, early on in your career, you want to kind of set goals for the long term and decide you know, how you're going to divide up time, spending time with family versus international work and things like that. But um, yeah, the sooner you get involved, the sooner you can kind of get all that stuff squared away. But um, Please, if, um, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to take those in my emails here. Um, please feel free to, to contact me with any questions, um, and if there's anything I can, I can do to help you sort of in your path.